Hey everybody out there in isolation lands. Thanks for tuning back in for another tour at the animal room, the Sultan Stall Animal Room at the Science Center in Ithaca, New York. I'm Colin. And I'm going to show you all around the animal room again today. I held off on feeding a handful of tanks so you all could watch. I've had you all up on the reef tank for a while as it's my favorite exhibit and it is nearing its end. I am going to feed a few animals so be warned if you don't like to watch animals eat please look away. Our reef tank we feed them little mysis. Mysis they're like a little shrimp like creature. They're frozen so they're already dead nobody's getting eaten alive here but you can see how excited everybody is to get their food. Reef tanks are a lot of fun to care for, but they're a lot of work to take care of as well. They need very pristine, perfect water conditions. Everything needs to stay constant and stable as much as possible. Corals are really interesting animals because they grow much more like plants, but they are indeed animals. They're communal creatures, so they're made up of lots of sort of individual animals that are all one organism. There's a neat way to propagate them by breaking them into pieces and having each new little piece grow into its own coral. Perhaps at some point I'll be able to sit down and do a little fragging seminar, show you all how to break corals apart and propagate them. I'm going to move you all over to the lionfish and give them some food. It'll be pretty quick. Got some bad glare here from our beaded lizard behind us. Maybe I can deal with that here. There we go, get rid of most of that. These guys we feed um, a frozen diet to. It is essentially ground up sea creatures made into a gel form. You can see how excited they get as soon as they see the food. Oh boy. And they're fast eaters. They gobble up their food hole. There we go. Easy come, easy go. Okay, next I'm going to move you all over to... We're going to spend most of today in our native room. Whoa! Sorry for the bumpy ride. We're going to spend most of today in the native room, looking at some of the creatures that we can find right in our own backyard here in New York. We're going to make a quick stop here, though. I had a request to check out our rhino rat snakes, or as some people like to call them, unicorn snakes. Oh boy, making you all dizzy there, sorry. Here's our male. Where is he? There he is. He's cruising around right now. Checking things out. Hoping to find a little lizard or a pool with a fish stuck in it. Probably not going to have much luck with any of that today though. Then we've got our female up here. She's basking up in the tree. 
with her face. There she is. Hey there, mama. I believe that she is gravid now. I believe she has a belly full of eggs. She, the male, they've stopped breeding some time ago. The female's been looking rather plump, though I don't think she's been eating recently. And she's been sitting up in the tree, basking herself, helping cook those eggs, helping things develop along so that she'll be ready to lay them in some amount of time. So there are our rhino rat snakes. Now let's head on over to our native room. Oh, of course we'll stop and say a quick hi. There we go. To our panther chameleon. I was just in there watering him, so he's a little angry. He's got his dark angry colors on. Then we'll come on over here, say hi to our Angolan python. Little AP, we got to watch him eat last time. So now he's laying low, still probably digesting that mouse. And now we'll come on into our New York native room. So in New York, we keep lots of animals here at the Science Center, but the only ones we actually have to have permits for are our New York native species. The Department of Environmental Conservation wants to make sure that people aren't abusing our native creatures or keeping them when they shouldn't. And so this is the one group of animals in our collection that I maintain permits for. So here's one of our Eastern Newts. Eastern newts are one of the most widespread and plentiful uh, salamanders, possibly in the world, I believe. They're found pretty much throughout all of the U.S. and much of North America. They're, um, our eastern newts have a really neat life cycle. They start off as when the adults lay the eggs. Those eggs develop into little larval salamanders, which are essentially like tadpoles with external gills, feathery gills on the outside of them. Let's see if we can find another one. Oh, no, that one moved. Oh, here it is. Here's one of them climbing up out of the water, climbing up into the moss, probably looking for some little springtails to eat. So they start off as a little larval sal, a little larval like tadpole-like creature, and then as they grow up, they grow their legs and arms, and they absorb their gills and go through the first metamorphosis of their life, and at that point they turn into red Fs. And maybe you all have seen red Fs. When you go out into the forest, or sometimes you can find them in fields when it's been nice and moist, and they're they look like the eastern newts, like these adults here, but they're a bright red color with usually black spots. And the red Fs will truck around on land for anywhere from one to three years as they grow and get larger and develop. And then once they're a full grown size, then they'll head back to a body of water and go through a second metamorphosis. And the second one isn't quite as profound. They don't grow any new appendages or lose any appendages or anything, but their skin, which is thickened to be a red eft and to help them keep from drying out on land, becomes thinner and more permeable, so they're able to go back into the water and do air exchange while they're in the water to some extent. And then, uh, and then they also change color into this adult coloration, this sort of yellowish-brown color, and they, their spots change a bit. And then they live pretty much the rest of their lives in the water. These newts came from my pond at home on our farm. It is uh, a fish-free pond, so it's loaded with amphibians. Where there's always tons of newts. 
It's an interesting thing because at home at our ponds, there's hundreds, if not even thousands of newts in the pond, and yet we've never seen an adult newt out of the water. We find red Fs all the time, and we often find them heading back to the water to go through their second metamorphosis, but we've never found an adult out of the water. And yet here at the Science Center in captivity, they regularly climb up into this moss, which we keep we seed with little springtails, little columbula, pretty regularly so that there's plenty in there and they like to come and eat those. We generally feed the adults blood worms that we put in the water, but they seem to like coming up here into the moss and eating, eating springtails. So those are our eastern newts. Now let's come over here and we'll look at our spotted salamanders. It's a really fun time of year right now. The salamander migration has just happened for the most part. It's already happened on our pond and we're way up in the hills in Caroline and so we're usually one of the last places to have the migration happen. We've been down and we've seen the salamanders in our pond. These spotted salamanders, there's a tail. I'll get in close here and we'll be able to see them a little better in just a moment. Nope, and I see a face poking out. There we go. There's a cute little salamander. Spotted salamanders are what are often called fossorial. They spend almost all of their time underground. They like to find little burrows and nooks and crannies and go under logs where they just kind of hang out and move around and wait for little slithery, slimy worms or bugs or things to come, come by which they can grab and gobble up. And that's pretty much their life through the entire year except for the spring migration. During the first warm rain of spring, usually the first rain above 50 degrees, though it can be influenced by many other environmental factors, the salamanders come out of the woods and head back to the, uh, the nearest body of water, typically the body of water that they grew up in, and they all congregate there, and they'll be salamanders thick in the water that night, and often for a number of nights, where the males will be laying spermatophores and trying to entice the females to pick them up to fertilize their eggs, and so the the substrate at the bottom of the pond becomes covered with spermatophores. It looks like a, the Milky Way. It looks like stars all over. And at night when the salamanders are active, you can find, in our pond at least, we'll have thousands and thousands of these spotted salamanders. They're really beautiful animals. Let me now try to get you all into this exhibit. Let you see a little closer here. I am running out of length on my cords. But I think I can get this camera in here. Try to get you all up close and personal. There we go. So that's one of our little spotted salamanders. I've got you all set up there with the hope. And again, I'll have to warn you, I'm going to feed these guys. They love to eat red wigglers. We have a few worm bins. Maybe some of you little guys have played with our worm bins during some of our uh, Science Together programs. We like to get them out and let people play with the worms. But we raise the worms to feed to these guys and some of the others. Oh, he got a piece of that worm. that again. There we go. Gobbling that worm right up.
See if I can open this log up a little bit, and get a little slightly better view, and see if we can get that other salamander to take a worm. These guys, again, spend almost their entire life buried underground, trying to stay hidden. So when I expose them like this, they're not usually super happy about it. They don't really like bright lights, and they feel a lot safer. Oh, we're losing that one. Yeah, they're not real happy about me exposing them. Yep. And off they go. Well, these spotted salamanders are about one of the largest, they may be the largest salamander in New York. And they're beautiful animals with their dark black color and the beautiful yellow bright bright yellow spots on them and they do have they typically have some little blue spots on their side Let's see if I can fish this guy out here oh he's going up into the log and leave me alone I don't want you messing with me salamanders in my hand. Let me get this log back in place. Try to make sure I'm not squishing anybody. Pull that camera back out. Give you guys a closer look at this one in my hands. Oh. So this is spotted salamander. Focus, there we go. See the beautiful animals. There's some of the little blue spots on their sides. It can be fun this time of year to try to go out and find these guys. Still probably not too late. They're most active at night, so it helps to go out to a pond at nighttime with a good flashlight or headlamp. You often find these guys right on the water's edge. Oh, I'm gonna need to use two hands here. Make sure this guy doesn't fall. There we go. Now, if you do want to go out finding some salamanders, it's fun to check them out and look at them, but it's best not to do much with them. Just take a look at them. Their skin is very sensitive and so if you have any chemical contaminants on your hands you could potentially make them sick. It may actually be illegal to handle wildlife without a permit. But really it's in the animal's best interest not to be handled too much or to be taken home. It's fun to look at them. Not not so good to take them home and put them in terraria. We keep a few here. Again, these animals were collected from my pond. That has a very healthy population. And with permits from the DEC. Right back under his log. I tried to only collect male salamanders as well because that has the, a lesser impact on the wild populations. So I definitely encourage you all to go out and look in some ponds or streams or marshes. There's lots of fun critters to find out there and we're lucky up here in New York there's not many dangerous things to worry about. If you're lucky enough to live in an area with a Massasagua that could be a fun find but you do want to be careful of them. But here in the Ithaca area there's pretty much nothing dangerous that can bother you. But again always best to just look, maybe take some pictures but to let the animals stay in their, their habitats. It's where they are healthiest and happiest and do their best. 
Next, I'm going to bring you all over to our stream exhibit. And we've got the great backdrop of Taganic Falls falling right into our stream here. And in this exhibit, we've got a couple frogs and a couple turtles. They don't always get along super well, but they usually do all right. Here's our musk turtle. And we call this guy Stinky. One of their common names is the Stink Pot. I think that's the musk turtle. Yeah, it is. Not the mud turtle. Very similar, but uh, the musk turtle, um, many people mistake this for a baby snapping turtle. And it has a nice, big, strong beak like a snapping turtle does. But it is a different species. And this is a, a pretty close to full grown animal. These guys are typically found in shallower waters, bogs and marshes, and, uh, but I think they, uh, their range is fairly wide. They can give a pretty hard, strong bite. And they're called a stink pot because they have uh, musk organs that they can release a stinky, stinky smell from to try to scare predators away. And then our other turtle, let's get down here quickly before it gets out of view. This is our little painted turtle. This animal was actually brought to us by a conservation officer. Someone unfortunately had the very bad idea that they could go and collect a painted turtle and keep it for a while and then they got on some website to try to sell the turtle, which is, well, very illegal. So the DEC confiscated this turtle and contacted us to see if we would be willing and able to take it. And we had this exhibit thought we'd, we'd help them out and take this one. This is, I believe, a little female. Oh, she's scared of me. She doesn't like the camera. She's hoping for some worms, but she's a little camera shy. Let me not disappoint them and give them a few worms. So again, I'm going to feed these guys. Do be wary if you don't want to see turtles eat worms. Oops, if I grab the right container. I'll try to lure them back into view here. Kind of hard to operate a camera and feed a turtle at the same time. There we go, he got his worm. got a painted turtle looking for some too. Best to try to keep them from fighting with each other when I can help it. And there we go, there's our turtles having one of their favorite meals. sometimes gets to be a little bossy and picks on our painted turtle. As you can see the painted turtle generally doesn't have any trouble holding her own. Oh, there's it, buddy. There you go. And next we're going to go try to see if we can get, give our frogs some enrichment. Let those turtles fight over their last couple worms there. Let me see if I can get this camera set up just right. 
not get it too wet. So in this exhibit, we have two frogs. We have a bullfrog and a green frog. Our bullfrog is a big giant female, and our green frog's a, a male. He's, he's a decent size, but he's a lot smaller than our bullfrog. Bullfrog is hiding now. She always gets scared of me. She likes our keepers more than she likes me. She likes to come and try to bite our keepers, actually. Uh, but the green frog, the green frog loves to do some acrobatics. So let me see if I can get him to do this. He's hiding in a little spot just in front of the camera. And when I take worms and fling them up on the back wall there, you can see some wiggling down. Hopefully, yep, there we go. He saw them. And now he's going to try to grab those worms. So we'll have to give him a minute. Oh, look at him go. Fell right back in his hole again. He'll probably come back out and try that again. It helps when the worms wiggle a little bit. There we go. Go for it, buddy. Go for it. Oh, he's trying. Got to jump better than that. Oh, almost. Got close on that one. So bullfrogs and green frogs are two of the most common frogs that you'll find in ponds. And while the green frog has the name green frog, bullfrogs can be just as green, if not even more green, than some bullfrogs. Their color is not a reliable way to tell the two species apart. But there is a pretty simple tell on which is which. I'll try to zoom in on this guy once he has a couple worms, see if we can get a good look at it. They have what's called a skin fold that goes down their back. It's a little ridge of skin um, that is on their backside that's usually pretty easy to see. Um, and the green frog has that skin fold that extends from, its, from behind its eye and goes past its tympanic membrane, its ear-like structure, and then continues the whole length down its back. And so that skin fold leak going down the whole back is, a, is always found on green frogs. Whereas with bullfrogs, that skin fold starts behind the eye as well, but immediately just wraps around the tympanic membrane, almost like glasses wrapping around someone's ear. And they do not have a skin fold down their back. So their back is, well, I don't know that it's smooth, it may be bumpy and rough, but it does not have a skin fold going down the back. So that's an easy way to tell green frogs and bullfrogs apart. Let's just look for that skin fold on the back, or the absence of it. Um, looks like our worms are not moving enough for him. Try to toss another one there. Oh, there he goes. Trying again. Still hasn't gotten one yet, though. And then the way you can tell males and females, at least with bullfrogs and green frogs, this is true, with both species, if you look at the tympanic membrane on the frog and compare it to its eyeball, it's the relative size difference between them that tells you males from females. Males have very large tympanic membranes, much larger than their eyeball whereas females have tympanic membranes that are generally just about the same size as their eyeball. So that's an easy way to tell the two genders apart. The reason that exists is because males, it is males that do all the croaking that you hear. Um, and uh, they do that to try to attract mates to find a female and they also do it to try to stake out their territory from other males to say, this is my spot, you should not be here. And so it's more important, oh, still can't get them. 
Let me help him out. We've got to watch him jump a few times. Let me see if I can, I'll be generous and just offer him a few, see if he'll take him from my tongs. Oh, he keeps looking up. There we go, he got one. Let me zoom on into him now. Let you all get a closer look at him. Maybe, oops. Maybe you'll be able to see his skin fold a little better if I get in closer. You can also try to take a look at his eye and his tympanic membrane. So he's down in this hole here. There we go. Uh, he's tucked a little too deep for us to get a good look. Yeah, he doesn't like me messing with him. I'll back off, give him a little privacy. I'll come over here, see if I can turn our bullfrog out. She will likely get scared and leap into the water. There's our painted turtle. Looking for more worms. Let me open up this side. I'll give you a peek in here. We'll see what this camera can do. She likes to hide in the overflow here. Let's see if I can get you all in there without getting this camera wet. There we go. Maybe you can make her out there. That's our bullfrog. She likes to just stay tucked in there where she feels safe. Oh, there's our green frog coming back out trying to make some more jumps. Good jumper. He's having trouble getting his worms though. Let me bring you all back to the bullfrog. I'm gonna see if I can get her to grab some worms for us. From us. From me. Get a little bundle of worms here. Seeming super hungry. Not hungry enough to come out at least. I'm gonna go ahead and pull this rock off. Maybe we'll get a look at her before she hops away. Oh, nope. There she goes. Hops right away. Ah, might be able to get a look at her down in the water here. She is a big, glorious frog. She hangs out here. They've got those big bug eyes, so she can stay almost completely submerged with just her eyeballs out. Trying to stay safe. Let me see if I can circle around here. Oh, no, I'm scaring her. Too much glare here. There she is. When she gets scared, she just hops into the water and hangs out underwater. Being cold blooded and having permeable skin means they can stay underwater for a really long time. Let's see if I can get a good shot of her down here. In the glass. There she is. So you can see on her back, she has a really mottled coloration, not a whole lot of green on this bullfrog, but you can see there's no skin fold on her. You might be able to see the skin fold there going around the tympanic membrane just behind her eye, but there is no membrane that comes down the back. So that's our bullfrog. Okay, and the last tank to show you here in the native room We've looked at these guys before, but I'll show you again because they're such cool fish. These are, this is our brook trout tank. This tank was made possible. We were given a grant by the North American Native Fish Association, NAMFA. 
they gave us a grant so that we could afford to buy a giant chiller that we have down in the basement and plunk, plumbed into this tank. Um, trout require cold, clean water to live. And unfortunately, trouts um, are not able to breed in many of the streams that they used to in New York because temperatures are too warm. The brook trout are our New York native state fish. They're beautiful animals. I'm gonna get this camera a little closer real quick. Try to show off how pretty they are. One way you can easily tell our native trout, the brook trout, from the introduced species, the rainbows and the uh, brown trout, are that the brook trout, the native species, have light spots on a dark background. You see these guys, they've got the light spots there on the dark background. They also have that blazing white leading edge on their fins. Really stands out, really beautiful. I think these are just super gorgeous fish. The, um, the non-native species, the rainbows and the brown trout, they have um, dark spots on a light background. So that's one way when you're just walking along a stream and seeing a trout that you may be able to tell the difference what you're seeing. So we're really appreciative of NANFA for the grant to be able to turn this into a trout tank. You all may remember the, the channel catfish that lived in here previously. He was a glorious, glorious fish, loved him greatly, but he did not love many other fish. Well, or maybe he loved them a little too much. All the other fish I tried to keep with him, he eventually got large enough to be able to gobble them up. So he was the only fish to live in this tank. So here I'm going to give these guys some food. We primarily feed them uh, pelletized trout food. But they love worms too, so I've got a few leftover worms that I'll toss in here as well. There's lots of pellets. and some worms too. These guys also love to eat crickets. Well, that is it for my tour today. I appreciate you all tuning in and checking out our animals. We certainly miss having people here getting to see the animals in person and look forward to the time when we can have you all back again. Well, take care and uh, tune in Friday at 3 p.m. I'll do another tour and show off some more critters then. Well, take care, stay safe, stay healthy, and stay socially distant. So long.